Today is Friday, March 26. You've got an exam tomorrow. Um, and you're very, very excited about it, I can tell. I can tell there's a lot of tension in the air, and I'm very sorry that it starts with me. Um, I apologize for all the damage I am causing to your lives and your relationships. I don't know that I've told you the story of um, the fight Amber and I had in the fall of 2001. Uh, I was newly home from the mission. I was taking 351. It had been two years since I took general chemistry. So I was sort of freaking out about uh, my future and worrying. And so I studied a lot. In fact, I've shown some of you in my office my old OCHEM textbook in which basically every word is underlined, which is totally idiotic. I mean, come on, Joshua. If everything's underlined, nothing is, right? You can't digest each and every word. But in any case, I was spending way too much time uh, studying and Amber asked me, we were on this drive and I could tell she wasn't happy. I still remember we were driving on University Avenue down by the, at the end of Provo down by the mall. And uh, she said, well, don't you want to spend more time with me? Because I would spend till like nine or 9.30 every night uh, studying. And then I'd run over to King Henry where she lived and spend like five minutes with her kiss her goodnight and then run back home and go to sleep because I had to get up early. Don't you want to spend more time with me? And she said, um, or no, and I said to her, well, on Wednesdays I, I could. <laughs> Which, you know, we were dating and moving towards getting engaged and that was, in retrospect, a very bad answer. Later on, I learned to just study OCHEM over at her house so that we could at least be in the same room. Um, but anyway, I understand the strain this can, this can in, induce in relationships, and I'm sorry. Uh, some of you are begging me to open up this top one, Answers to Exam 3. Ha ha, those are actually just notes from office hours. I'm playing a joke on you. You are not, amu you are not amused, right? We are not amused at that. Okay. <laughs> no, there's, there's some anger being expressed. So... Uh, I want to spend a couple minutes trying some synthesis problems. The, the way you get good at these is by trying them and screwing up and figuring out what the right answer is and then trying a similar problem. Uh, some of this problems, some of the synthesis problems in the text at the end of the chapter are pretty easy. Others are more difficult. We'll just do a couple of these, and I don't know whether or not I've assigned them in the study guides, but you can just basically go to the end of chapters 10 and 11 and pick whatever problem you want to do. Uh, this is the desired product, and as with any good synthesis problem, you have an allowed starting material. So thankfully, a lot of uh, the molecules are already in place. Okay. So um, steps for avoiding anxiety in synthesis problems. Step number one, focus on what's changing, learn what you can ignore. Uh, in my starting material, I notice a five-membered ring. Now I know some of you, when you see rings of any kind, you have ring anxiety, but fortunately, the ring is still there in the product. So that becomes something you can basically ignore, right? because you're not having to change any bonds there. Okay, well, give yourself a break and make the thing simpler. That's not changing, so just replace it. With an R group. Now, we didn't change anything important about that problem, but it may look more doable to you for some reason. One of the skills that I tend to take for granted because <clears throat> I've been at this for like 20 years. Um, I feel so old. But Amber just turned 42 this week, and I'm still only 41, so that's kind of fun. Um, anyway, uh, it makes it a little bit easier when you know what you can ignore. All right. So now we have a starting point, and we have an ending point. 
and we and uh, sometimes it's a little too open ended to say what do I know what do I what can I do with this starting material because there's a ton of things you might do with that. So perhaps a better place to start is at the end. This is an epoxide and you might now want to ask what reagents and what starting material give me epoxide as a product. Okay. Right now, there's only one. We're going to learn another one in chapter 12, but right now there is only one way we know of how to make an epoxide. Okay? And so what are you going to do if you don't remember this? Well, it might make some sense for you to generate a sheet of paper on which you write down all the reactions you know, starting material, reagent, and products, uh, in as simple a way as possible so that you can scan it easily and refresh your memory. Remember, this test is open open book, open notes, though it is time, so you want to make sure you have information uh, readily available to you. Okay, anybody happen to remember what we did before to make an epoxide? Hannah, I'm hearing you, but you're, but you're whispering it, so commit. Say it loudly. Do you mind? You're thinking halohydrin? So that would be like this. And then what would you do to that halo hydrin to make the epoxide? Deprotonate. Got to, yeah, deprotonate the, remove the out proton from the alcohol to get the negatively charged oxygen, which will then do an intramolecular SN2 type reaction. Okay, so we've exchanged a more difficult synthesis problem for a slightly less difficult synthesis problem. We still need to connect, connect the dots from our starting material to this newer product. So now we ask, now we identify this product as a halo hydrin. You don't have to remember names, but certainly the structural pattern is important. Oxygen and halide on adjacent carbons because That'll clue you into a starting material and reagents that give this as a product. So what is that? Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Uh, for the double bond, uh, that's going to be uh, on that, uh, yeah, right there. Okay. You're going to have uh, Br2 and H2O. You use bromine and water, and that gives you the halo hydrin, and it puts the oxygen on the more substituted carbon. Uh, good. All right, now we're, we've got a perhaps simpler problem. Do we know anything that could take us directly from the starting material to that intermediate? Just, an e, e2 Just a regular E2 reaction. Now, since that is a primary alkyl halide, probably Uh, if it's a primary alkyl halide, probably you want to use a sterically hindered base to avoid competition with SN2 reactions. So we'll choose tert potassium tert butoxide. The potassium is just a counter ion. Don't worry about it. That does the elimination reaction, gives you the olefin. Uh, halohydrin formation gives you uh, this product, which you deprotonate, and that gets you to the epoxide. Okay, so that's, I don't know, one, two, three steps. Notice it was, hope, uh, hopefully you can see that it was easier to start at the end and think about what the last step might have been, and then take individual steps backwards until you get to something that you can see would, would have come from this starting material. Uh, I'm missing some questions on the chat. Um, so we've covered everything uh, in chapter 11 that we're gonna cover. Uh, what we're doing now is practicing synthesis. Uh, and could you use a chloride for the halo hydrin formation instead? Yes, and that's another important point uh, that sometimes I've observed students are uncomfortable with. Many of us would like there to be the right answer, and we want someone to tell us, you've got the right answer and pat us on the head because that feels good. In synthesis, sometimes there are multiple ways to get uh, from A to B, and 
the only standard for judging them is, does your chemistry work? All right, so it is not wrong to use chlorohydrin formation instead of bromohydrin formation. That's just fine. It is fine to use another sterically hindered base besides just the tert butoxide. It would be fine to use another kind of base here as long as it's a base that's not a good nucleophile because you don't want to do an SN2 reaction. Um, let's see. And ultimately in chapter 12, we're going to see a reaction that circumvents the halohydrin and just goes straight from the olefin to the epoxide. And that's fine too. None of those answers are wrong. Does the chemistry work? Sure. And, and frankly, there's a whole branch of organic chemistry where labs try to take a molecule that people have synthesized already and do it faster and more efficiently. And it's kind of, unfortunately, it's a bit of a testosterone flexing kind of uh, contest. And, uh, you know, it's not... You have people arguing, well, I synthesized it first, this complicated natural product. And they're like, yeah, yeah, big deal. I synthesized it better. And then somebody else comes along and publishes a paper that says, you're both idiots. I synthesized it even better than you guys. And, and it goes on and on. This is why I'm not a synthetic organic chemist, by the way. Um, hey, Dr. Yes, go ahead. Um, there was just some confusion in the chat on whether or not is chapter 11 on the test? Yes, the stuff we talked about last time is on the test and what we are doing now is practice of that material. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, question so far on strategy? Go ahead. Yeah, so what are the requirements for the reagent that you use to get the halohydrin to the epoxide? Uh, you just, yeah, to get from halohydrin to the epoxide, what are the requirements for the reagent? It needs probably to be, uh, I would say, a strong base, strong enough to remove a proton from an alcohol, but probably you want one that is not a good nucleophile uh, because you don't want to deal with the competing substitution reaction at the primary alkyl bromide. Uh, but I would be... I think generous and let you basically use any base that could remove that proton. Uh, that being said, it'll, these questions will be a little bit less open-ended on an exam because of course you're going to be choosing from existing options rather than just making stuff up. All right, other questions? Yeah. So chapter 12, that's not going to be on this test? Or? Yeah, um, I will go ahead and make that very clear not on chapter 12 is not on this test where test refers to the winter 2021 351 sections I don't know 1 through 500 <laughs> exam 3 in per Perpetuity ad nauseum world without end, Josh Price dripping blood. Okay. <laughs> That's about as firm a commitment as I can make. All right. Um, so someone on the chat asks, uh, Kiana asks, will you, I'll just show you some al alternative processes and you pick the ones that work or the one that works for a synthesis question? Yeah, exactly. Okay, other questions? Go ahead, Ty. Will the wrong answers be wrong because they don't form the product or they do it too slowly or both? Generally, the wrong answers will be wrong because they don't work. They use the wrong reagent. Uh, now, I suppose I could ask a question where I would say, here's a couple of synthetic pathways. One is better than the other. Why might that be? Hannah's saying, please don't ask that. Um, I don't think I have, but one example of that might be um, this ether. 
And suppose uh, we wanted to make this ether and we had two possibilities. One would be to take this reagent and this alkyl halide, and the other would be to take this alkoxide and then this alkyl halide. Um, one of these is better than the other. This is based on chapter seven and eight stuff. Can you tell which one's better than the other? So, oh, we have a controversy. Some people are saying left, others are saying right. Okay. Um, let's judge the, each pathway by considering the potential for interference from other things. Here you've got a good nucleophile that is also a good base. Here you've got a secondary alkyl halide. We learned in chapter seven and eight that those are conditions in which SN2 and E2 can compete. So yeah, you probably would get the desired product, but you would be worried about the formation of uh, the E2 product where the chloro would be eliminated. And this is the conjugate acid of, uh, sorry, the base that we were using. Um, in contrast here, you've got something that is a good nucleophile and a good base. Some of you are worried that that's starting to look a lot like tert butoxide, but this is the only thing we've said is too sterically hindered, along, I guess, with DBU and DBN, to do SN, or too sterically hindered to do SN2 chemistry. This one should be fine. And uh, a primary alkyl halide, we've said SN2 dominates just because it's so fast. So, yeah, you could do this reaction, and that would be the better one because it doesn't have a competing side pathway. Um, but in any case, I mean, if there, there will be, for the synthesis questions, there will be one answer that works uh, and others that don't, or there will be a clear way to choose why one is better than the other. So um, these are some, some good questions. Caroline asks, what's the best way to really learn and solidify this? And Wallace says, and I Agree, practice, practice, practice. It's, he says, it's not a skill you can learn by reading or having it explained, you have to practice it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's true. Um, and maybe this is a good time for me to wax a little philosophical. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the learning process lately and I've observed that some students are very, uh, some students have a fear of making mistakes. And I think we do this to you, frankly, as instructors, because we give you exams where if you make mistakes, you experience pain in the form of uh, lost points. Um, and, and one could argue about whether that's the right strategy, but it certainly isn't the right phil uh, philosophy. If you think about how humans learn and develop, right, when children are born, they know nothing. Their brains have like trillions of more connections than yours and mine do, and they just sort of toddle around and bump into stuff, and then the brain starts cutting out connections that make you bump into stuff, and then suddenly they can learn to walk. It's trial and error, right? And when a child falls down, would you say to them, you idiot, you made a mistake. Now you've got that against you, and you're never going to get over it. You're never going to be able to progress. You're never going to be able to learn because you made a mistake. Would we instead say to the child, now sit there and don't actually attempt to walk yet. We're going to explain all of the intricacies to you. We're gonna make it so that you understand every bone in your body and how they move together. And then you're gonna intellectually understand this process. And then you're gonna walk and not make a mistake. Frankly, that may sound good to some of us, but uh, on the other hand, it's incredibly inefficient. Right? I don't even know how walking works. And I've been doing it for a long time. Some of you have taken anatomy and you know a little bit better than me on that. But you don't need to know all the details to figure out how to do something. You just practice until you do it, right? It's the same way that uh, once you know how to do something, it becomes difficult to explain it to somebody else. Uh, Sometimes we do this with the gospel. We think, okay, we've got the commandments, and so the goal is after I get baptized to never, ever, ever sin. In fact, it, it would be much less risk-averse for me to just sort of sit in my house and never go anywhere 
and never do anything, and then I wouldn't be sinning, right? But that's like burying your talent in the sand, and Jesus didn't like that. Why? Well, because you don't learn anything by just sitting in your house not making mistakes, right? You're supposed to get out there and do your best and bump into stuff and then say, well, that was stupid. I'm not going to do that again. Uh, and you have heavenly parents that are forgiving of you. This is part of the process. It's not like a bug. Jesus wasn't sent because, well, technically it's possible to be perfect, but, uh, but, but there may be some among the humans that aren't going to be able to do that, and so Jesus is the patch on the plan of salvation. No, he's the whole thing, right? He's the whole reason that you can even... Uh, grow by your own experience, which is the whole purpose here. If you want to sit and learn anything intellectually and not have to take any risks or make mistakes, you're sort of asking for a Lucifer's plan, which was damned because it doesn't lead to any kind of progression. Now, how does that apply to OCHEM? When you're practicing, rejoice when you make mistakes, right? Paul says, shall we sin therefore that grace may abound? God forbid. No, we don't want to sin just so we can get more grace from Jesus. But in organic chemistry, yes, you want to make as many mistakes as quickly as possible, figure out why you made them and say, okay, now I don't have to do that again. And so um, as you approach problems and your homework, but also as you approach the exam, take a little bit of the anxiety out of it by allowing yourself to mess up and learn from the experience. No matter what happens in this class, um, things are gonna be okay in your life. Even if the class doesn't end with a grade that you want, there's lots of pathways forward towards happiness and productivity, all right? So, end speech. And hopefully by now you've forgotten about that terribly embarrassing image of me. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, you know what? You're going to turn 42 someday, and, and you may have a dad bod as well. Um, it'll happen to you. I did deadlift a lot this morning, though, so I do have that going for me. Right? Man, I'm so freaking embarrassed. <laughs> okay, we need to do some more problems. Um, please don't write that in your course evaluations. Right? Please just don't. <laughs> All right, um, so synthesis practice. Some of you have asked for practice on some, well, let's maybe do another synthesis and then I wanna do a couple of mechanisms. I wanna take something from chapter 11. Hmm. Okay. So, synthesize each compound from acetylene. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sure. Uh, all right, and your allowed starting materials are this alkyne and any other reagents. That is also anxiety inducing because that might mean there might be multiple ways to do this. So um, you've got to use acetylene and we got to somehow get it in this molecule with two, four, six, eight carbons. And we need to get a ketone in there. So what I would recommend is thinking, do we know any reaction so far that has a ketone as a product. This is a chapter 11 reaction, one that we would have learned just barely last time. Got anything? Okay, you can get that if we had first made this enol. I told you that the enol rapidly tautomerizes spontaneously. In fact, you don't even isolate the enol, you just isolate the ketone. All right, and where would we get that enol from? Okay, having an alkyne there, uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, sure, and then how do we do that? What's the, what's the reaction?
I'm sorry, say that again? You're thinking out loud? Okay. Okay, do we know a reaction that gets us from the alkyne to the enol? That's chapter 11, so go ahead. Hydroboration oxidation, that is one of the options that works. Uh, hydroboration oxidation puts the OH on the less substituted carbon, only in this case, they're both equally substituted, so it doesn't matter. Your alternative would be acid catalyzed uh, a, a hydration of an alkyne. Okay, so yeah, that does get you to the ketone. There you go. Um, then, then what? What are we going to do now? We've got to use acetylene. So do you see anything that's clear about how we might make this larger structure from this smaller starting material? Do you know of any reactions that attach an sp hybridized carbon to an sp3 hybridized carbon? We learned about that and did a few examples of that last time. That's just the SN2 reaction, right? And hopefully you can see we don't necessarily need to go through it, but if you did two of those in a sequence, you could get to that alkyne, right? Okay. So this is a bit of a puzzle, a bit of something you're going to need to practice. Um, keep working on it. I think that the synthesis examples on the, the exam are not going to be as complicated as the big horrible one we did last time. Uh, but they're going to start to get more and more complicated as we get through chapter 12. So it's something to keep uh, working on. Uh, yeah, regular hydration would work to get the enol as well. Okay. So um, some of you have asked for increased practice on terpene-like chemistry. Um, there are some practice problems at the end of chapter 10 that uh, if, if they don't have anything to do with terpenes, they at least involve similar types of transformations. Um, so... Should we do the horrible one? <laughs> yes, let's do the horrible one. So here we have a six-membered ring, and we're just going to keep turning up the dial on the stress and anxiety by adding other rings to this molecule. Yikes, there's a four-membered ring and a five-membered ring. Yes, that's it. And then uh, you're told that under acidic conditions, the molecule can rearrange itself. Oh. Into this. <laughs> and the only hint you get is there might be a carbocation rearrangement. Oh, really? Great. Okay. So how do you approach this? Um, there are a lot of different things you can do, but it might actually, in terms of strategy, if you think about what we need to do, you got a five, a four, and a six, and you need to contract the six-membered ring to five and expand the four-membered ring to five as well. Uh, Carbocation rearrangement might be able to do that because you might have one of the carbons in this ring move over, uh, move a bond over and do a, do a shift. Um, that being said, if, if you're gonna put this molecule in acid, your homo attacks lumo intuition should lead you to the conclusion that, okay, we're going to protonate the electrons of the pi bond. The new, the less substituted carbon gets the hydrogen so that the more substituted carbon can have the positive charge. <laughs> okay. So how might we rearrange things at this stage? We've got a carbocation. Can you see a way 
anything we might do that would uh, convert a six-membered ring into a five-membered ring. Look for groups beta to the positive charge. You've been trained to do that to look for elimination reactions. For carbocation rearrangements, you look for atoms that are beta to the positive charge. Uh, on this beta carbon, you have a methyl group. If that shifted over, it certainly could, but that doesn't change the ring situation. So that's maybe, though possible, not productive for this mechanism. Uh, if this one shifted over, that could work too. That would expand the four-membered ring into uh, four, a five-membered ring, but it wouldn't change the six-membered ring. So how about this one? What if this carbon moves over? What if we uh, take this bond, take the carbon, I guess I'm gonna uh, highlight that carbon in blue. What if we have that lean over and form a bond here? Let's just draw what that would look like. And when you do this, it can actually be good to First, not worry about trying to change the shape of the molecule. In fact, draw it again in exactly the same way. And then erase the, oops. Nope, it didn't want to do that. Okay, we'll erase the bond that we moved. We'll draw the new bond that we formed. And we've got to put the positive charge on the carbon that used to be our beta carbon. All right, see what we did? Now our blue carbon is bonded to this one instead of that one. Okay, now let's see whether we're starting to get uh, reasonable connectivity. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So we've got three five-membered rings. Now that we've done that, we can redraw that in a way that maybe makes a little more sense. You have two five-membered rings that share a side like this and another two that share a side like that. There's a methyl group here. There's a methyl group there, another there. Uh, and a positive charge there. I'm, I'm looking at the, oh, in the product I miss, I was missing a methyl group. I'm missing two methyl groups. I'm starting to get worried. Okay, so now we ask, is there a step that gets us from there to the final product? What would you do? Just regular old, elimination of a beta proton, an E1-like step, and there we go. So that looked horrible. It was seriously only three steps. So um, one message from all of this is that you can do quite a bit with these simple steps. The first step was basically hydration or um, I don't know, it's the first step of hydrohalogenation and the first step of hydration. Maybe we would just call that protonation of the double bond. Then you have a one, two alkyl shift, and then you have E1 style elimination. Those are three steps straight out of our alphabet of things that terpene uh, chemistry can do. All right, question so far. Yeah. Uh huh. So, uh, yeah, the question is about carbocation rearrangements. The only things that can do carbocation rearrangements are things that are attached to beta carbons. All right, so technically these protons could and or these protons. Neither of these would do it, though, because you'd be rearranging a 
tertiary carbocation into something less stable. So you're just looking for things that are beta to the positive charge. And that's why I highlighted these three different things that we could conceivably move over. In a predict the product sense, I'm not sure how you determine which one you should move over. That would not be a fair question. But given a connectivity of the product, you can figure out which one you had to move over to get the product. Yeah, we're not predicting a product, we're just drawing the mechanism that led to the product. Yeah. So it would be the beta carbon itself doesn't move, it's things connected to the beta carbon. That's right. It's not the beta carbon itself that moves, but things that are uh, attached to the beta carbon. So. I, you know, I don't know if we want to go so far as to call it a gamma carbon, that might be silly. Things, either hydrogens or alkyl groups or methyl groups attached to the beta carbon can do carbocation rearrangement. Um, there's a question I'm not sure I understand. Uh, beta protons don't have to be directly adjacent. Um, I, I think, no, they, they do. We're calling the carbon that has the positive charge the alpha carbon. And any carbon that's bonded to that alpha carbon, we're calling a beta carbon. And protons on the beta carbon, we're also calling beta protons. I suppose if you wanted to call them something else, if you wanted to say protons on the beta carbon instead of beta protons, you could. I'm just too lazy. as you can see from that horrible image. Man, if I quit talking about it, maybe you guys will forget. All right, what else? Yeah? Uh, would we have to know how to manipulate it so that we would only move the blue carbon instead of the yellow or the green carbon? Would you have to know how, what do you mean by that? How to manipulate it so that you would only move the blue instead of the yellow or the green? No, you wouldn't worry about this in a synthesis. That's a totally unfair question. And it's also totally unfair for me to give you this and say, add acid and then what happens? Because there's any number of things that could happen, right? But given where you need to end up, you should be able to find a pathway through. Now, sometimes there might be multiple mechanistic pathways that could lead to the final product. Maybe if you moved a couple other things, you could get that too. The standard is, do the mechanistic steps work? And clearly I'm not going to give you two different types of mechanisms that both work and have you choose between them, okay? Uh, you'll be choosing mechanistic steps that lead from a given starting material to a product. All right, what else? Yeah? So how do you know if the, the last step has to go by E1 and not E2? Uh, how do you know the last step has to go by E1 and E2? E2 is for when there's a leaving group yeah. and E1 Technically, I don't know that we'd count this as E1 in the sense that there was no leaving group that left first, but it's, uh, it's like the second step of E1, where you remove a proton that's beta to a positive charge. All right, yes? How do you know that's the proton that would be removed? How do you know that's the proton that would be removed? Simply because that's the one that puts the alkene in the right place in the product. You're right to consider that proton also being beta to the positive charge. And if, and, but again, this is not predicting a product, is showing how a particular product forms. So that base could decontaminate all of those other hydrogens as well? Well, I only see two, I only see, there's only two kinds of beta hydrogens. There's ones here and ones there. So it would be reasonable if this, in a predict products question, yeah, you'd think about all the possible products, but this isn't a predict products question. This is just draw the mechanism that gives this product. How do you choose between two beta protons that have the same connectivity? Um, for E1 type reactions, for protons that are beta to a positive charge, uh, I think maybe you're pointing out that there are two beta protons there. It won't matter which one, they both give the same product. Okay. Anything else? 
Do you want to do another terrible one? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any anything to stop me from talking about chapter twelve? Yes. Right. That's a that's a great question. And, and I think, you know, uh, if we were doing this in the lab, you might expect to see not only um, th uh, the elimination product, but maybe the product from having like water attack at that carbon. Is that sort of what you're asking about? Yeah. Um, and you're you're right to be thinking about it. Um, if we indeed only find this product, all of these steps are equilibrium steps. You can go forwards or backwards. And when that's the case, the most stable product is the observed product. So it's possible that this option is just more stable than all the other side reactions. But again, I'm not asking you to predict what happens. Just given what happens, how do you get from here to there? Yeah, so you're, you're thinking exactly uh, correct, you know, in terms of thinking about predicting products and worrying about possibilities. Yes, you know, if I just gave you a carbo cation and, uh, and I told you to predict the products that would come from it, yeah, you would worry about a nucleophile attacking at the positively charged alpha carbon. But because the product doesn't have that happening here, we, we can just not worry about it. All right. So there's another one that I think is of a similar level of difficulty. It also has a ring in it. And we're also going to make a ring. Uh, and this is going to be our product. And it's going to happen under acid catalyzed conditions and water is going to leave. Uh, all right. So what should we do? Well, uh, if you look at the product, it looks like the carbon that has the two methyl groups here is probably the same as the carbon that has the two methyl groups there. So somehow it looks like we've got to make a bond between this carbon of the alkene and the orange carbon that has the two methyl groups on it. Let's just see if that's the case. We need to count atoms to see if it would actually make a six-membered ring. Sure enough. Okay. So somehow we got to make that bond. We're under acidic conditions and uh, you've got the alcohol there so probably you first protonate the alcohol to turn it into a good leaving group. Then the leaving group leaves. Let's draw that intermediate. That's a secondary carbocation. Notice that uh, if we had the pi electrons attack that positive charge, we could make a ring, but it wouldn't be a six-membered ring. It would be a five-membered ring. We know we need not a five-membered ring, but a six-membered ring. So it would make sense to get the positive charge over there onto carbon six. Is there a clear pathway using a mechanism that you know that would make that happen. One, two, hydride shift, bingo. Or bing pot, actually, as, the, as Jake Peralta and Captain Holt say on the show, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. That's, that's Amber and my go-to police comedy now. It's pretty funny. All right, so one, two hydride shift puts the positive charge where we need it to be. Now we can form the bond between one and six simply by having the pi electrons attack the positive charge. 
Doing so will form a bond between what we've called carbon one and six so that the positive charge can be on the more substituted carbon where it's more stable. Here's the new bond we formed. And then now getting from this to our product is as simple as having some base, probably the conjugate base of our acid, do the sort of second step of E1 elimination to give you the product. Again, three actual simple steps to create a crazy complicated transformation, but you didn't have to do many things to get from A to B. So when you're faced with this kind of question, uh, a mechanism question where a lot of things are happening, take a deep breath knowing that the mechanistic steps are gonna have to look familiar, right? Uh, in, in terpene-like things, it's going to involve protonating an oxygen, making a good leaving group, water leaves to give a carbocation. Maybe there's a carbocation rearrangement. Maybe there's a pi bond to tax a positive charge. Maybe there's an E1 style elimination. Those are sort of the alphabets. Uh, no, those are sort of the letters of the mechanistic alphabet that you're going to use to convert A to B. All right, when do you do a hydride shift versus a methyl shift? Like in this case, why did you do a hydride shift? Uh, first of all, I did the hydride shift because that was the only way I could get the positive charge on the carbon with the two methyls. And I know those two methyls still have to be attached to that carbon in the final product. The other reason you know is if I did a one, two methyl shift here, that would turn a secondary carbocation into another secondary carbocation. And of my available options, that's not a good, that's not a particularly good one. If instead I do the hydride shift, I get to convert a less stable secondary carbocation into a more stable tertiary carbocation. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Is there a case where you could convert from a tertiary carbocation into secondary just so you could get the desired product? Um, only in a mechanism question of, of this kind. So I gave you a terpene practice uh, kind of thing and I showed you connectivity in a final product and the way you get there requires the carbon with the two methyl groups to be bonded to the other carbon with a methyl group. And uh, that has to involve a shift that, an alkyl shift that, a uh, one, two alkyl shift that has a tertiary carbocation going to a less stable secondary carbocation. That's okay here because it leads to the desired product. There's actually way more to the story. Um, there's some evidence that these two are actually resonant structures of each other. No atoms move, just electrons. And so, but that's a topic for my grad level OCHEM class, not necessarily to worry here. Basically, if you have to do it to get the right connectivity, it's fine. But I would never ask you to predict that this thing would happen, but perhaps to draw the mechanism after the fact. Yeah. All right, well, that's it for us. I'm grateful for iMovie. I'm going to edit out that whole section in the middle where I tried to show you pictures of my children. All right, we'll see you.